Hi YouTube, it's Joshua Miles and welcome back to my channel. Today's video is going to be yet another case for my Curious Case series. I know this is the third video that I've posted this week. I'm on a bit of a roll at the moment and I'm really enjoying being back and researching all these cases and making these videos for you. But before we delve into this video, I'd just like to say that at the end of this video, I'm going to be giving a quick shout out to a few of my favorite true crime creators on this platform. So once you're done watching this video, you can jump over to their channels and binge watch all of their cases. Cases. So be sure that you stick around to the very end for that. I'd just like to point out this video has not been made to cause disrespect or anything like that. It's just been made to spread awareness about this case by compiling information from various different public sources on the internet. Any theories discussed in this video are just that. They are theories, they are not facts, and they shouldn't be taken as such. And any opinions expressed in this video don't represent the views of myself, law enforcement, or anybody else connected to this case unless otherwise stated. And the reason I have to say all that, like I said in my last video, is because I don't want to get sued for anything. Uh, so with all that being said, let's delve right into this case. Tuesday the 7th of August 1973 would be a day that would haunt the memories of those who owned CB radios or citizen band radios in the state of New Mexico for decades to come. That Tuesday evening at about 9.45 p.m., CB radios across central New Mexico lit up with the disturbing sound of cries for help. When CB radio hobbyists and operators ran to their systems to reply and assist, they discovered the cries to be coming from a little boy. The little boy frantically identified himself as Larry, and he told those who were listening that he had been with his father driving in a desolate area of the state on a rabbit hunt when his dad collapsed while driving, resulting in his truck crashing and overturning with them inside. Larry went on to say that his father seemingly died in the crash, leaving this young boy alone and stranded. The boy also said that he was unable to get any of the doors to open in the car, meaning not only was this child alone, he was also trapped. Larry went on to say that he was seven years old and as a result of the crash, he too was also hurt. However, he didn't really mention how he was hurt or where he was hurt or to what degree he was hurt. Those who heard Larry's cries for help immediately informed the authorities and as most of the reports were coming in from Albuquerque, New Mexico, the Albuquerque police raced to try and find the seven-year-old boy. Volunteers from emergency radio groups also joined in the search and by the following day, on Wednesday the 8th of August 1973, everybody knew that they were racing against the clock to find Larry. You see, it was already a miracle that the CB radio was still functional, as it is powered typically by the truck's battery. Which, as we all know, without the engine running and the battery being recharged by the engine, would very quickly drain. I'm sure we've all been in that situation where we've accidentally left the headlight lights on overnight or something on in the car overnight and went, went to get in the car the next day and the battery was dead. Now the CB radio could also have had its own internal battery however this internal battery didn't have a big capacity meaning that it would also drain really quickly through constant use. It's estimated that the internal battery could only really have powered the radio for perhaps four or five hours. Now for those of you who may not be familiar with CB radios, according to the CB radio Wikipedia page, Citizens Band Radio, aka CB radio, is a land mobile radio system that allows short distance, person to person, bi-directional voice communication. Think walkie talkies, but on steroids. In fact, I believe walkie talkies are a form of CB radio. CB radios are very commonly used in trucks to, for example, communicate traffic 
traffic conditions and other information to other truckers on the road. They are also used by hobbyists across the world. The radio is defaultly set in a receive mode as to receive incoming transmissions on the channel it's set to. And when a user wants to talk, just like with a walkie talkie, they press and hold a button which switches the radio to transmission mode. Transmitter power is limited to four watts in the United States and the EU, and they have a range of about three to 20 miles depending on terrain. It wouldn't have been uncommon for the truck such as the one that Larry's father drove to have a CB radio installed in it, especially if that truck was frequently used for hunting expeditions. According to the initial newspaper articles on this case, Larry's transmissions using the CB radio sporadically switch between cries for help and a continuous transmission tone, and that continuous transmission tone is caused by the push to talk button being held down. It's also reported that he was frequently switching between different channels on the radio. This is where the case begins to get really interesting. Due to the fact that Larry had been transmitting almost continuously since Tuesday evening, many people, including law enforcement, began to speculate that these calls for help may simply be some cruel and sick hoax. Amateur radio operators who are based on top of Sandia Crest, which is just east of Albuquerque, some 10,000 feet above sea level, actually made contact with Larry for a brief period of time. However, the contact soon ceased and the radio operators were left to transmit come on back and talk to us some more Larry on a multitude of channels, presuming him to have seized contact with them because he'd switched the channel. Police believe the signal to be originating from southeast of Albuquerque and east of the Manzano Mountains. According to reports, state police and the National Guard flew planes over the area with their radio systems tuned to the bands that Larry was last heard on. The search teams were against the clock to locate Larry before his radio would run out of power and and he would be left alone in the wilderness. The police managed to extract some further information from Larry during one of their brief communications with him. And in those communications, the seven-year-old told the police that he had been on a trip with his father, making their way to Los Lunas, which is just south of Albuquerque. Uh, and as they were making this journey, his father collapsed at the wheel. Police then attempted to find out whether Larry was himself from Albuquerque or where he was from, where he was born, where his home was, but they were unable to get a concrete answer from him and unable to extract that information. Towards the end of Wednesday, almost 24 hours after Larry's first distress calls, Larry's transmissions began to get weaker and weaker and intermittent. His signal would frequently break up during his communications. This told the search teams and the police that it was only a matter of time before Larry's CB radio would run out of power. Interestingly, Larry's cries for help were heard and reported by CB radio operators from coast to coast in America, with some signals being picked up as far north as Canada. This began to further fuel the theory that Larry's cries for help may be a hoax. How could such a small truck CB radio, which is designed to broadcast and transmit over short distances, like I said earlier, three to 20 miles, broadcast from New Mexico all the way north to Canada and transmit as far as the east and west coast. CB radio experts were brought in to try and aid the police in trying to determine whether this entire case is some kind of elaborate hoax. They wanted to assess the likelihood that lost boy Larry was a real person. These experts informed the police of a phenomenon in CB radio called CB skipping or DX. CB skip or DX is a phenomenon where certain atmospheric conditions and landscape conditions allow for a CB radio transmission to travel over really far distances. According to CBRadioMagazine.com, these conditions can allow a signal to bounce from state to state and even from country to country. I'm not going to delve into the scientific reason behind CB skipping or anything like that because I feel like the majority of you might actually fall asleep if I start talking about that, but it is a phenomenon that uh, is common with CB radio, and it's an important piece of context in this case. At the time, it was common for CB radio operators in the United States to use the lower sideband of 
uh, radio channels to do this CB skipping. We know from early reports that Larry had been changing his transmission channel sporadically, so it wouldn't be unlikely for him to stumble onto the lower sideband of channels and unintentionally CB skip. The signal could bounce off the mountains in the area and result in operators on the coasts of the states picking up Larry's cries for help. Although, another reason for the police's suspicion that Lost Boy Larry is just some cruel hoax was the fact that during all the communications that different CB radio operators had with Larry, he was never able to give his full name. Although it's important to quickly side note that there were a few reports of him being called Larry Peak, um, his last name being Peak, but that was only in one or two unverifiable sources. It was theorized by members of public that since Larry had been involved in a car crash that had resulted in the vehicle becoming overturned, it would have been likely that he might have hit his head or had some kind of brain injury, which could have caused a degree of amnesia or something to that effect. It could have caused him to simply just be very disorientated. After all, in the 70s, it wasn't uncommon for people to drive around without seatbelts on. And obviously, as we know now, driving and being involved in car crashes without the use of a seatbelt can result in very, very serious injuries. And as you can imagine, this truck overturning itself would have thrown Larry if he wasn't wearing a seatbelt all over the place. Further to this, Larry was seven years old, likely very afraid and trapped in a car next to his deceased father. It was said at the time that this fear could have made it very difficult for the child to communicate these important details or answer certain important questions. Also, as a quick side note, there is the possibility that perhaps Larry had already some kind of uh, mental disability or something to that effect that could have meant that he, you know, didn't know this information or it just further meant that he was unable to answer these questions. We don't know for sure. Perhaps this child had been drilled on stranger danger and in his traumatized state, he kept that policy close to heart and kept the lessons that he'd been taught about stranger danger close to heart and just didn't want to give out any private uh, information uh, because he was scared. After all, he was talking to strangers over the radio. According to some sources, the term stranger danger arose in a multitude of campaigns that ran in the USA throughout the 1960s and 70s. So it would have been likely that Larry was aware of the campaign. If you don't know about this campaign, which I'm sure everybody from the UK and the United States is very aware of this campaign, it's essentially a campaign run by the government to say, don't trust strangers. It's the idea or warning that all strangers could potentially be dangerous. Although it would later come out that you are far more likely to be kidnapped or abused by somebody you know, a family member or a friend, uh, than a complete stranger. So uh, the campaign was ultimately reversed, but that's outside the scope of this video. Some people queried how Larry in an overturned vehicle was able to broadcast over long distances in the first place as the long antenna used for CB radio would have been on top of the truck and thus in the overturned vehicle would have either been damaged or embedded into the ground. Larry could simply have been lucky and the antenna might not have been damaged in the car crash or perhaps the antenna became detached and still able to be used or perhaps it was an antenna that wasn't on the outside of the vehicle. Again, we, we just don't know for certain. By Thursday evening, Larry's story had made headline news. Despite their best efforts, authorities were unable to pinpoint the origin of the radio transmissions in which the seven-year-old boy cried for help. A state police sergeant told the Albuquerque Journal that the bouncing of radio waves off the rolling hills, canyons, and mountaintops in the Manzano mountain area is making the search impossible. The sergeant went on to say that they had been receiving tip-offs and rumors from California all the way to Ontario from concerned citizens who've happened to pick up on the distress calls. Although he adds all those rumors have so far proven to be false. The surge efforts entailed more than 200 volunteers on horseback, motorcycle, and in four-wheel drive vehicles combing through the mountains.
mountains. Three helicopters, two of which were from the National Guard and three airplanes were used to help in the search efforts. But it's important to note that none of these aircraft ever received a transmission from Larry. In fact, throughout late Thursday afternoon, no transmission that was verifiable was received from Larry by anybody. An army mobile unit was also dispatched that had equipment on board that was able to latch on to radio signal beams from the boy's radio in an attempt to locate the boy, though they were unable to maintain radio contact and get a fix on Larry's location. The last known positive voice contact made with Larry was at 2.15pm that Thursday afternoon, though the contact was simply a weak voice modulation. Radio operators were able to use their meters to confirm that the voice modulation was in fact Larry. One radio operator broadcast a message instruction to Larry to activate his microphone and yell as loud as possible down it. Immediately following that instruction, their monitors showed a weak transmission consistent with Larry's transmission. The weak transmission obviously being put down to the fact that Larry's CB radio was running out of power or was about to run out of power. This operator attempted to get further information out of Larry by asking questions in which he could just scream at the microphone in a response. Um, but he was unable to extract any more information from Larry. And that was the last official communication with Larry. Throughout Thursday, however, officials were battling with a sea of misinformation. Amateur radio operators reporting that Larry was actually 50 miles further south from the search area they were currently searching in, with others even saying that he was in a completely different state. Many people began to grow even more suspicious of how Larry's CB radio battery had survived this long despite the numerous transmissions. And then when some transmissions were reported on the Friday, these suspicions just grew even stronger. Not only was the radio battery lasting so long suspicious, but also the fact that there were different reports of conflicting information from CB radio operators who were having alleged conversations with Larry. One report claims that Larry's real name was actually David Peake and not Larry. Others say that Larry's father was actually still alive but badly injured and some others say that Larry had managed to get out of the car but was lacking in food and water. Though interestingly the first CB radio operator to make contact with Larry and to report it to the authorities back on that Tuesday evening claims to have heard Larry say over the radio, David, come and help me, which could indicate that there might be a third person involved in this crash, or perhaps Larry's father was called David Peake, or perhaps, you know, there is a brother or something else like that. And it is theorized that the CB radio operators who had allegedly spoken to a David actually spoke to this brother, David. Unfortunately, it is next to impossible to verify these reports because absolutely anybody could anonymously use the CB radio and communicate these things and transmit these things. Though if you spoke to any of the CB radio operators who were in communication with Larry throughout that week, they would say that Larry was completely real and that it wasn't a hoax at all. Interestingly, several questions were posed by the authorities. Why had Larry's signals suddenly been picked up in Montana, Ontario and Arizona, while weak or no signals had been picked up in New Mexico? Was Larry even still in New Mexico? Was he even in New Mexico to begin with? Why were the batteries still functioning? Experts say that the batteries would very, very, very likely have been dead by the Thursday morning, c considering the continuous transmissions from Larry. Why did Larry say in a transmission on Friday that his father was now just hurt and not dead? Why had his story changed? Did his father wake up? Why was Larry unable to give any information about himself? The town he was born in, the school he went to, and things like that. How had Larry survived without food and water for this long? Why were there conflicting reports on whether Larry was outside the truck or trapped inside? Did Larry even exist? At one point over the Friday searches, one CB radio operator claimed to have made contact with a boy claiming to be Larry, and this boy told the CB radio operator that he could 
see the searchlights from planes and helicopters flying over. At the time that transmission was received, the search aircraft were flying over the Manzano mountain area, which was south of Albuquerque. When Saturday the 11th of August 1973 came around, the officials in this case began to believe that this is entirely a hoax. A cruel prank played by some novice radio operators that got out of hand. Maybe they were testing out CB skip or something like that. However, a fresh lead came into the authorities on the Saturday when a report of a family from Missouri who had been traveling out west of Albuquerque had gone missing. And that family had a young son named Larry, who it was reported was very familiar with the operation of CB radios and walkie talkies. The search efforts intensified as a result of this report. Perhaps this is the missing leads that the authorities needed. The following day, on Sunday the 12th of August, an army sergeant claims to have a three hour long conversation with Larry. And he claims to have that conversation in the morning of the Sunday. Although this three hour long conversation was heavily disputed by experts and the authorities simply on the basis that the CB radio that Larry had would have not had charge on the Sunday by the time the Sunday had come around and it would not have had enough battery power to have lasted a three hour long transmission. That same day, the missing family from Missouri was fortunately found alive and safe. It was confirmed that same day that their son Larry in that family was not the same Larry that had been making these transmissions. And then on Monday the 13th of August 1973, the search efforts for Larry were called off. Interestingly to note, the transmissions received on the Saturday and the Sunday were actually traced to a young boy who was broadcasting on a walkie-talkie in Phoenix. This young boy had been playing some kind of practical joke and his transmissions were that of a hoax. By Friday the 24th of August, the police chief held a press conference and in this press conference, he told the media that they had exhausted all leads and that they had nothing else to investigate and that they found no concrete evidence that the situation was real at all. They found nothing to say that Larry had actually existed. The following day on Saturday the 25th of August, a family from Ohio was reported missing. Now what's interesting about this report is the family from Ohio had actually been missing for several weeks before they had been reported. And just like with the previous missing family, they had a young son called Larry who was familiar with CB radios. The police chief following the publication of this information announced that they would not be reopening the investigation unless further concrete evidence was found or any link. Four days later, on the 29th of August 1973, the missing family from Ohio was also found safe and well, and it was confirmed that their Larry was not the same Larry that had been involved in these transmissions. And that's really where this case goes cold. Interestingly, no missing person reports have ever been filed that match the description of Larry and his father. According to one source, three pilots of either a helicopter or an airplane spotted a red truck in the New Mexico desert. Though I couldn't verify this information and I couldn't determine whether there was any follow-up to this lead. Another source claims that the search efforts for Larry was so poorly organized and so chaotic that even if Larry had been in the area they were searching, there was no guarantee that he would have been found. The chaotic levels of reports and misinformation likely impacted the rescue team's search efforts and likely hindered any rescue attempts that could have been made. Many, many people believe the case of Lost Boy Larry to simply be a sick and cruel hoax. Though many others believe the initial transmissions are actually from Larry, an actual person, an actual child, and the initial transmissions to be real, though they believe the later transmissions were not real and were as a result of people playing cruel pranks. They believe that after the first day or so, Larry succumbed to his environment. And as I said, the later transmissions being copycats or hoaxes. The fact that Larry's story hit the headlines of the newspapers so quickly 
it would have been really easy for anybody to get quite a substantial amount of information about this case and then play a cruel prank. After all, due to the anonymity of the CB radio community, it would have been really, really easy for anybody to fake being Larry and fake being a child, and it would have been really difficult for anybody to track those signals back to the original source. It would have been next to impossible to determine who had been sending these signals. Yes, those radio signals can be traced, but only uh, when the radio signals are being transmitted. A quote from the Albuquerque Journal says, Unofficially and off the record, many persons involved in the search express their feeling that the transmissions are a hoax, or at least the transmissions subsequent to the original, and maybe valid one, had been the work of pranksters. If the initial transmission was real, there is a possibility that the boy had already died, some officials feel. The lack of missing persons reports being filed in this case could simply be down to a lack of other family members or not being in contact with other family members. There have been one too many Jane or John Doe cases where a family member hasn't been reported missing as they had fallen out of contact with their family and they just hadn't known or noticed that they'd gone missing, they just didn't know because they, they had fallen out of contact. According to missingpeople.org.uk, research suggests that as many as 7 in 10 missing children are not reported to the police when they go missing. Further to this, it's practically unknown just how many adults go missing that are not reported. The thought of that is just heartbreaking to me. The unreported missing Wikipedia page lists a number of potential reasons that a person could become a unreported missing. For example, the lost slash missing person might be estranged from family or friends, as I said earlier. Law enforcement may not take a missing person's report. The lost or missing person may be in the country illegally. The person may be an unknown dependent child of unreported missing adults or teens, or the person may be the victim of an undiscovered crime. Further to this, some people voluntarily go missing. Surprisingly, foster children are a massive source of unreported missing people. In the United States, children in foster care are protected by confidentiality laws. Their identity and the fact that they are in the foster care system is private information. In the majority of US states, when foster children go missing, their name is not publicly released. Based on 2002 statistics, of the approximately 585,000 foster children in the US, 20% of them are missing at any given time, with 98% of those missing foster children thought to be runaways, and 2% of them unaccounted for. Perhaps Larry was a foster child, or perhaps he and his father and his family were in the country illegally, or perhaps his family was involved in something criminal. But I want to know what you think. Do you believe Larry was real? It breaks my heart to think that there might have been a seven-year-old boy out there alone in distress calling for help on his radio and the actions of other pranksters hindering the efforts uh, to find him and causing the officials to believe that this is some kind of a hoax. A seven-year-old's last moments wondering why, despite all of the transmissions and attempts to, to seek help and all the conversations with strangers, why nobody was coming to rescue him. That just gives me chills. I also think it's absolutely insane and crazy that people chimed in with copycat transmissions and pranks. I just don't and won't ever understand that kind of mentality and that kind of lack of awareness of the consequences of their actions, especially when it is as serious as it is in this case. My heart truly wants to believe that this entire case was some cruel hoax that was blown way out of proportion. Perhaps somebody was just messing with their CB radio, was really good at putting on a young child's voice, uh, or, and it just, as soon as it hit the headlines, it blew, blew out of proportion, um, and they didn't know what to do, so they just, you know, they just let it go. But my brain is telling me that 
there is some kind of element of truth behind this. Let me know what you think in the comment section down below. And that's everything that I have for you in this case. Thank you so much for watching this episode in my Curious Case series. If you want to request a case for me to cover here on this channel, then you can do so over on my website, requestacase.com. There's a form over there that you can fill out, um, and I frequently look through those uh, submissions to pick cases. Be sure to subscribe to this channel if you want to see more true crime content just like this one, and hit that bell icon so you can be notified every single time that I post a brand new true crime video. Don't forget to follow me over on Instagram and Twitter. I mentioned at the start of this video that I wanted to give a shout out to a few true crime creators on this platform that I think are absolutely incredible. The first YouTuber is a South African YouTuber named Mufundo Nadalo, and her content is really, really well researched and really, really respectful. She primarily covers unknown, interesting cases from South Africa. So be sure to go check her out. I'll leave a link to her in the description and in the pinned comments. Subscribe to her and leave a comment on her most recent video telling her that I sent you. Secondly is Kirsty Sky. I've mentioned her a few times on this channel. I've worked with her on this channel before. I've worked with Mofundo before on this channel, but Kirsty's videos are always outstanding. Kirsty covers Jane and John Doe cases as well as murder mysteries, so be sure to go subscribe and tell her that I sent you. Again, you can find a link to her channel in the description box down below and in the pinned comments. She's actually the twin sister of another really good friend of mine called Dark Curiosities, who I am sure you have heard of. But that is a bit of fun trivia for you right there. The third and final creator that I want to share with you today is another good friend of mine and her name is Molly Westbrook. If you haven't heard of Molly, then uh, what are you doing? Just like with Mufundu and Kirsty, she does really, really, really well-researched cases, really, really respectful cases, and a lot of the time, really, really unknown cases. And I couldn't recommend her content enough, so be sure to go check her out too. Her link is also in the description and in the pinned comments. Be sure to go tell her that I sent you. Again, I'm really interested in knowing your theories in this case. No concrete evidence was ever found that confirmed Larry's existence, despite that one unverifiable report from those three pilots of seeing a uh, red truck in the New Mexico desert. Let me know your thoughts in the comment section down below, and with all that being said, I'll see you in the next case.